Hello. Um, we are going to read the final chapter in Heidi. It's called <clears throat> Parting to Meet Again. And here's the picture. A day before her arrival, the grandmama had written a letter telling exactly when she was coming. Peter brought this letter with him early the next morning on his way to the pasture. He handed it to the uncle who stood outside the hut with the children. Then he rushed off as if something had frightened him. After stopping only once to look behind him, he gave a leap and ran up the mountain. Grandfather, said Heidi, why does Peter act as Big Turk does when he feels the rod behind him? Perhaps Peter feels that there is a rod behind him too and knows he deserves it, answered her grandfather quietly. Peter ran without stopping until he could no longer be seen from below. Only then did he dare stand still, turning his head timidly in every direction. Suddenly he leaped into the air and looked behind him, as frightened as if someone had just seized him by the nape of the neck. From behind every bush and out of every thicket, he thought he saw a policeman from Frankfurt rushing at him. <laughs> Excuse me. Meanwhile, Heidi had gone into the hut to put it in order, for she wanted everything to look tidy for the grandmama. She cleaned in every corner while Clara watched, and they chatted so merrily that the morning passed before they realized it. Then they came out and sat down on the bench in front of the hut to wait. At this moment, the grandfather returned from a walk, carrying a bunch of deep blue gentians. They were so lovely that the children shouted for joy. <clears throat> they settled down to wait again. But every little while, Heidi jumped up and down the mountain, hoping to catch sight of the grandmama's party. At last, she saw exactly what she had been expecting. First came the guide. Sorry about that. I had an important phone call. All right, I'm going to go back to where the paragraph starts. They settled down to wait again. But every little while, Heidi jumped up and looked down the mountain, hoping to catch sight of the grandmama's party. At last, she saw exactly what she had been expecting. First came the guide, and then the grandmama on a white horse. <clears throat> last of all came the porter with a big basket on his back, for the grandmama would never think of coming up on the mountain without taking plenty of wraps with her. The brisk mountain air might be cool. Nearer and nearer they came, when they reached the hut, the grandmama looked down at the children from her horse. What do I see, Clarchen? You are not sitting in your chair, she exclaimed in alarm and dismounted hastily. But before she had reached the children, she clapped her hands in the greatest excitement. Clarchen, is it you or is it not? You have red cheeks as round as apples. Child, I don't know you any longer. She was about to rush at Clara when Heidi slipped unnoticed from the bench. Clara stood up and, leaning on her friend's shoulder, calmly started to walk. The grandmama stood still, still, frozen with fear, for her only thought was that Heidi was trying to do something rash. But what did she see before her? Clara was walking upright and safely beside Heidi. The girls looked at each other. The girls looked at her with beaming faces. She rushed toward them. Laughing and crying, she embraced Clara, then Heidi, then Clara again. Suddenly, she caught sight of the uncle who was standing by the bench and smiling with satisfaction. My dear uncle, we have you to thank for this, she said. It is your care and nursing and our Lord's sunshine and mountain air, interrupted the uncle smilingly. Yes, and Schwanley's milk too, added Clara. Grandmama, you ought to know how I can drink the goat's milk and how good it is. I can see that by your cheeks, Clarchen, said her grandmama laughing. I cannot look at you enough. I must send a telegram to your father in Paris. He must come immediately. I will not tell him why. This will be the greatest joy of his life. My dear uncle, can the men take a telegram down the mountain for us? They have gone, he replied. But if the grandmama is in haste, we can send the goat herd. That's when they're going to ask Peter. Hmm. <clears throat> The uncle went a little way aside and gave such a penetrating whistle through his fingers that the echo whistled back from the rocks above. Excuse me. It was not long before Peter came running down, for he knew the whistle well. He was white as chalk, for he thought the aunt uncle was calling him to judgment. 
but the alm uncle only handed him a paper on which the grandmama had written a few words and told him to take it to the postmaster in Dorfley. So Peter went along with the paper in his hand, much relieved for this time. At last, the others were able to sit down quietly together around the table in front of the hut. The grandmama had to be told everything from the beginning, how at first the grandfather had tried to have Clara stand and then take steps, how they had taken the journey up to the pasture and the wind had rolled away the chair, how Clara's eagerness to see the flowers had brought about her first attempt to walk. It was a long time before the children finished their story, for every little while the grandmama interrupted. It is really possible? Is the little girl before me with the round, fresh face, my pale, weak clarchin? Meanwhile, Ersesimon had finished his business in Paris and was also preparing a surprise. Without writing a word to his mother, he took the train one sunny morning for Basel. He had been separated from his little daughter for weeks, and he had been seized with such a longing to see her that he felt he could not wait another day. He reached Ragatz a few hours after his mother had left there. When he found that she had returned to the Alm, he immediately hired a carriage and drove to Mayenfeld. From there, he drove to Dorfli, and then he began the long walk up the mountain. But the climb proved harder and more tiresome than he had expected, and when no hut appeared in sight, he was worried. He had been told that the goat herd Peter lived in a hut halfway up the Alm, and when he looked at the footpaths leading in all directions, he was afraid he might have taken the wrong one. Or perhaps the hut lay on the other side of the mountain. Er Sesamon stopped and looked around, but there was no human being of whom he could ask the way. Far and wide there was nothing to be seen, nothing to be heard. Only the flies buzzed in the sunshine, and a merry bird piped here and there on a lonely larch tree. Just then, someone came running down from above. It was Peter with a dispatch in his hand. He was running straight ahead, down to steep places, and as soon as he came close enough, Er Sesamon beckoned. Peter came, trembling and frightened, not straight forward, but sideways, as if he could only advance with one foot and had to drag the other along after him. Here, youngster, brace up, said Er Sesamon encouragingly. Tell me if this path will bring me up to the hut where the old man lives with the child Heidi. Some people from Frankfurt are visiting there. Peter gasped in terror. Then he darted away and in his haste fell head over heels down the steep mountainside. Over and over he rolled, turning almost as many somersaults as the wheelchair had turned, but fortunately he did not go to pieces as the chair had done. Finally, on the last high slope above Dorfley, he rolled against a bush to which he could cling. What a bashful mountaineer, said Ersesimon to himself as he continued his journey, to be so afraid of a stranger. Peter lay trembling with fear, trying to think what had happened to him. He felt stiff and sore from his fall. He was terrified at the thought of the stranger who had asked the way to the Alm uncle's hut, for, hot, for Peter was convinced that a policeman from Frankfurt had come for him at last. Well, well, what's this? said a voice close by, and Peter looked up to see the baker grinning down at him. You must have come down in quite a hurry. Peter jumped to his feet. New fear seized him. The baker must know that the chair had been pushed. Without looking back once, he ran up the mountain again. He would have preferred to go home and creep into his bed so that no one could find him, but the uncle had told him to come back soon so the flock would not be left alone too long. In the course of his fall, he had lost the telegram, which was he was supposed to give to the postmaster in Dorfley. So he started back up the alm, limping and groaning and hoping that no one would see him. Meanwhile, Er Sesamon had reached the goat herd's hut, and he knew then that he was on the right path. He climbed with renewed zeal, and at last he saw his goal before him. There stood the alm hut and the dark branches of the old fir tree swaying above it. He smiled, thinking he, would, he was soon to surprise his child. But a, greater surprise, one he, what, but a greater surprise, one he little expected, was in store for him. When the company in front of the hut saw him coming, a, young, a tall young girl with yellow hair and rosy cheeks arose from the bench. She leaned on Heidi, whose dark eyes were sparkling with excitement and walked toward him with slow but easy steps. Er Sesamon stopped short. Exactly so had Clara's mother looked. Tears fell from his eyes as he gazed at the approaching children. He did not know whether he was awake or dreaming. Papa, don't you know me? Clara called. Am I so changed? The father rushed forward and took her in his arms. 
Yes, yes, you are changed. Is it you, Clarkson? Is it really you? He exclaimed. Then he stepped back and looked at her again to see whether it really was Clara standing erect before him. And here's a picture of really cute. Then the grandmama came out, for she could not wait any longer to see her son's happy face. Well, my dear son, what do you say now, said the grandmama. The surprise which you have given us is very lovely, but the one prepared for you is still lovelier, is it not? But now you must meet the uncle, our greatest benefactor. Certainly, and I must greet Heidi too, said Eric Sesamon, shaking hands with the child. Well, but I don't need to ask. No alpine rose could be more blooming. This is a great joy to me, child. Heidi looked with beaming eyes at the kind Air Sesamon. Then the grandmama took him to the alm uncle. While the two men were shaking hands and Air Sesamon was trying to express his deep felt thanks, the grandmama decided she wanted to look at the old fir trees again. Here there was another surprise awaiting her. Under the fir trees, where the long branches had left a free space, there was a big bunch of deep blue gentians, as fresh and shining as if they had grown there. The grandmama clapped her hands with delight and called the children. How lovely, she said. Heidi, did you put these here to surprise me? No, said Heidi, but I know who did. There are ever so many more up in the pasture, said Clara. Guess who brought the flowers for you early this morning? At that moment, a gentle rustling was heard behind the fir trees. Peter had come back, but when he saw who was standing in front of the hut with the uncle, he had decided to take the long way around to the pasture. But just as he was trying to slip past behind the fir trees, the grandmama caught sight of him. She thought that perhaps Peter had brought the flowers and that he was trying to creep away because he was so timid and modest. Come, my lad, she called. Don't be afraid. Petrified with fear, Peter stood still. Now they found out, he thought. He was very pale as he stepped out from behind the fir trees. Come straight here, said the grandmama encouragingly. Now tell me, my boy, if you did this. Peter did not lift his eyes, so did not see where the grandmama's finger was pointing. He had noticed the uncle standing by the corner of the hut, watching him out of keen gray eyes. Next to the uncle stood the most terrible pe person Peter could think of, the man he supposed was a policeman from Frankfurt. Y yes, he stammered, trembling in every limb as he answered the grandmama's question. Now, she said, what makes you so frightened? Because, because, because it is broken to pieces and can never be made whole again. Peter brought these words out with difficulty and his knees shook so he could hardly stand. The grandmama walked over to the corner of the hut. My dear uncle, is the poor boy out of his mind? She asked. Not in the least, said the uncle, but the boy is the wind that blew away the wheelchair and now he is expecting the punishment that he deserves. The grandmama could not believe this, for she did not think Peter looked wicked. Besides, he had no reason to destroy the wheelchair, which was so much needed. But the uncle had been suspicious all along, <clears throat> and he told the grandmama what he thought must have happened. Okay. <clears throat> When he had finished, the lady burst out in great excitement. We must not punish the poor fellow any long, any further. Let us be just. Strange people came here and took away Heidi, his only friend. Anger drove him to take revenge, and in anger, we are all foolish. <clears throat> the grandmama went back to the bench under the fir trees and called Peter to her. Stop trembling, my boy, and listen to me, she said kindly. You sent the wheelchair down the mountain in order to smash it. That was a wicked deed, and you knew it very well. You also knew that you deserved to be punished, and you have tried very hard not to let anyone know what you did. But you see, whoever does a wicked deed, or a wicked thing, and thinks no one knows about it is mistaken. The dear Lord sees and hears everything, and as soon as he notices that a person wants to conceal his wicked deed, he quickly awakens a little watchman that, slip, that sleeps in each one of us. This little watchman has a goad with which he pricks the person who has done wrong, saying, 
you are going to be found out. You are going to be punished. Is that not true, Peter? Peter nodded penitently. Furthermore, in this case, you are disappointed, the grandmama continued. The wrong you did helped the one you wished to harm. Clara no longer had a chair to be carried in, and when she wanted to see the flowers, <clears throat> she made a great effort to walk. So she learned how, and now she keeps on improving. After a while, she will be able to go up to the pastor every day. Do you understand, Peter? When one wishes to do a wicked thing, the dear Lord can take it quickly into his own hands and turn it into good for the one who was to be harmed. The scoundrel has his trouble for nothing and injures himself. Remember that, Peter, and if you ever want to do anything wicked, think of the little watchman inside you. Will you do that? Yes, I will, answered Peter, very much impressed. That is good. Then the matter is settled, said the grandmama. But now you ought to have something you like, to remember the people from Frankfurt by. Tell me, my boy, what would you like to have the best? Peter lifted his head and stared at the grandmama with his round, astonished eyes. He had been expecting some frightful punishment, and now he was to have whatever he liked best. Yes, I mean it, said the grandmama. You shall have something you like, as a token that we will think no more about the wrong you did. It began to dawn on Peter that he had no punishment to fear, and that the good lady had rescued him from the power of the policeman. He felt as relieved as if a mountain which was almost crushing him had been taken away. He also realized that it was better to confess his faults. I lost the paper too, he said. The grandmama had to think a little while before she realized that he was talking about the telegram. There, that is all right to tell me about it, she said kindly. Always confess if you have done wrong. Now, what would you like to have? The thought that he could choose anything in the world made Peter dizzy. The whole fair at Mayenfeld be came before his eyes with all the beautiful things upon which he had often gazed for hours and had thought he could never have. Peter had never owned more than five fennigs, and the lovely red whistles and round-handled knives and other alluring objects had always cost twice that much. He stood deep in thought, trying to decide if he would rather have a knife or a whistle. Then a bright idea came to him. If he asked for money, he could not have to decide he would not have to decide until the next fair. Ten finnigs, he replied. That is not extravagant, the grandmother said with a smile. Come here. She opened her purse and took out a big round silver coin. On it, she laid two small ten finnig pieces. This big coin is worth nearly as many ten finnig pieces as there are weeks in the year. You can use one every Sunday the whole year through. All my life long, asked Peter innocently. The grandmama laughed so hard that the gentleman stopped talking to hear what was going on. The grandmama kept on laughing. You shall have it, my boy. I will put it in my will. Then it will be handed over to you thus. To goat herd Peter a ten finnig piece weekly as long as he lives. Air Sesamon nodded in assent and laughed too. Peter looked again at the present in his hand to see if it was really true. Thank God, he said. Then he ran away, making extraordinary leaps. But this time he stayed on his feet, for now he was not driven by fear, but by such happiness as he had never known before. Later, when in front of the alm hut they had ended their happy midday meal, Clara took her father's hand. Oh, Papa, she said, if you only knew all that the grandfather has done for me, I shall never forget it. I wish I could do something to make him even half as happy as he has made me. That is my greatest desire also, my dear, said her father. I have been wondering how we can show him our gratitude. Air Sesamon rose and went to the uncle, who was sitting beside the grandmama. My dear friend, let us have a word together, he said, holding out his hand. For years I have had no real happiness, for what good was my money when I could not make my child well and strong? But with you, or but you, with the help of God, have made her well for me. I can never repay you for what you have done. But whatever is in my power, I want to do. Tell me, how can I show my gratitude? The uncle gave the happy father a smile of contentment. Air Sesamon, I have had my share of joy in Clara's recovery, he said. My pains have been well rewarded. I thank you for your kind offer, but there is nothing I need. As long as I live, I have enough for the child and myself. 
but I have one wish, and if that could be granted, I would never have another worry. Name your wish, my friend, urged Erstesevan. I am old, continued the uncle, and cannot live much longer. When I go, I cannot leave the child anything, and she has no relatives except one who might take advantage of her. If Er Sesamon would assure me that Heidi need never go among strangers to seek her bread, then he would have richly rewarded me for what I have done for him and his child. But my dear friend, that goes without saying, Er Sesamon burst forth. The child belongs to us. Ask my mother, my daughter. Heidi will never be left to other people. But if it will be any comfort for you or to you, my friend, here is my hand on it. I will say even more. The child is, this child is not made for a life in a strange land. We have seen that, but she has made friends. The doctor is coming up here again this autumn and will settle in this region. He found more pleasure in your company and the child's than in anyone else's. So you see, Heidi will have two protectors. May you both be preserved to her for a long, long time. The dear Lord grant it may be so, the grandmama added. Then she put her arm around Heidi and drew the child close. We must ask you a question also, she said. Come, tell me, have you a wish now that you would like to have granted? Indeed I have, answered Heidi. Then speak right out, said the grandmama. What would you like to have, child? I would like to get my bed in Frankfurt with the three thick pillows and the thick quilt and give it to the grandmother. Then she would not have to lie with her head downhill so that she can hardly breathe. She would be warm enough under the quilt and wouldn't always have to go to bed with a shawl on because she is so terribly cold. Heidi said this all in one breath in her eagerness. My dear Heidi, said the grandmama, it is a good thing that you remind me. In our joy, we easily forget what we ought to think of most. When the dear Lord sends us something good, we ought to think of those who are in need. We will telegraph to Frankfurt. Rottenmeier shall have the bed packed up this very day and in two days more it will be here. God willing, the grandmother shall sleep well in it. Heidi danced merrily around the grandma, but all at once she stood still. I must go down and tell the grandmother as fast as I can, she said. She will be troubled because I haven't been there for so long. No, no, Heidi, what are you thinking about, said her grandfather reprovingly. When one has visitors, one doesn't run away from them. But the grandmama took Heidi's part. My dear uncle, the child is right, she said. We have taken her away from the poor grandmother for a long time. We shall all go together to see her. I shall wait for my horse there, then go on my way. We can send a telegram at once to Frankfurt from Dorothy. My son, what do you think of it? Er Sesamon had not had a chance to speak about his plans, so he asked his mother to wait for a few minutes while he explained. Now that Clara was so much better, he wanted to take her and the grandmama on a little journey through Switzerland. He planned to spend the night in Dorfley and come back the next morning for Clara. They would meet the grandmama and Ragaz. Clara was disappointed to hear that she must leave the alm, but there were many other things for her to be happy about. Besides, there was no time to give way to grief. The grandmama grasped Heidi's hand and led the way down the mountain to the grandfather's, the grandmother's hut. The uncle picked Clara up in his arms and followed. Last of all came Er Sesamon. As Heidi walked beside Frau Sesamon, she talked about the grandmother, how she lived and how hard it was for her to get along, especially in winter. Then the grandmama listened thoughtfully while Heidi told how the grandmother sat bowed over in the corner, trembling with cold. When they reached the hut, Bridget was just hanging Peter's extra shirt out in the sun. She rushed into the house. They are all going away now, mother, she said. There is a whole procession of them. The uncle is with them. He is carrying the sick child. Oh, must it really be, sighed the grandmother. Did you see whether they were taking Heidi with them? If I could only hear her voice once more. The door was suddenly flung open as if by a whirlwind. Heidi rushed up to the grandmother and threw her arms around her neck. Grandmother, grandmother, my bed is coming from Frankfurt with three pillows and the thick quilt too. In two days it will be here. The grandmama said so. Heidi talked fast because she could hardly wait to see how happy the good news would make the grandmother. But though the grandmother smiled, there was sadness in her voice as she replied, Oh, what a good lady she is. I ought to be glad that she's going to take you with her, Heidi, but I shall not survive it long. 
do not worry, said a friendly voice, and the grandmama came forward to grasp the old lady's hand. Heidi is going to stay here and make you happy. We shall want to see the child again, but we will come to her. We shall come up to the alm every year, for we have reason to offer thanks to the dear Lord in this place where such a miracle has been wrought for our child. There was a joyful light in the grandmother's face as she pressed Frau Sesemann's hand. How, how is it possible that there are such good people who trouble themselves about a poor old woman and do so much for her, she said. My good grandmother, answered Frau Sesemann, before our father in heaven, we are all equally poor and it is necessary to all of us that he should not forget us. And now we must leave you, but we hope to see you again when we come back next year to the alm. The next morning when Clara's father came for her, she shed a few tears because she had to leave the beautiful alm. It will be summer again in no time, said Heidi, trying to comfort her friend. When you come back, it will be more beautiful than ever. But by then you'll be so strong, you can walk all the time, and we can go up to the pasture with the goats every day and see the flowers. Heidi's words comforted, comforted her a little. I will leave a greeting for Peter, Clara said, and for all the goats, especially Schwanli. If only I could give Schwanli a present. She has helped so much to make me well. You might send her a little salt, suggested Heidi. You know how she likes to lick the salt from grandfather's hand at night. Then I will send her a hundred pounds of salt from Frankfurt, said Clara. Er Sesamon beckoned to the children, for he wished to start. Clara rode down the mountain on the grandmama's white horse. Heidi stood at the edge of the slope and waved her hand to Clara until rider and horse disappeared in the distance. The bed came from Frankfurt and the grandmother still sleeps so well in it that she is gaining strength. The kind grandmama did not forget the hard winter on the mountain. She had a big box sent to goat herd Peter's house. There were many warm shawls and blankets packed in it for the grandmother. The doctor is living in Dorfley now. On the advice of his friend, he purchased the old building where the uncle lived with Heidi in the winter and which had once been a great mansion. The doctor is having the lofty room with the handsome stove rebuilt for his own dwelling. The other side is being restored as winter quarters for the uncle and Heidi, for the doctor knew the old man was independent and would want to have his own house. Behind it is a firmly built warm goat shed where Schwanley and Barley can spend the winter days in comfort. The doctor and the alm uncle are becoming better friends every day, and when they climb about the building to look after the progress of the work, they talk of Heidi. To both of them, their chief joy in the house is that they will be together with their happy child. My dear uncle, said the doctor one day, I feel as if next to you, I am the one to whom she belongs and I want her to share in my property like my own child. So when we have to leave her, she, we shall know that she will be well provided for. The uncle pressed the doctor's hand for a long time. He spoke not a word, but his good friend could read the old man's gratitude in his eyes. Meanwhile, Heidi and Peter were sitting with the grandmother, and Heidi had so much to tell them that she hardly stopped long enough to get her breath. All three were very happy because of the wonderful things that had happened. But Peter's mother, Bridget, looked almost the happiest of all. Heidi had told her it was really true that Peter was to have a tin finig piece every week for the rest of his life. Finally, the grandmother said, Heidi, read me a song of praise and thanksgiving. I feel like praising and glorifying our Lord in heaven and giving him thanks for all he has done for us. And that's the end. Oh, we finally finished the book. Oh, I'm going to go because this was a long recording, but I'm glad you stayed with me to listen to it. And I hope you have a great day and that you'll always remember the wonderful book of Heidi. Mm.